Hello, everybody who is joining us and those of you who might be joining us from the lobby. Welcome to U.S. Media Literacy Week. I'm Meg from Namely's Education Manager, and we're so thrilled you are here with us today. This week is all about celebrating Media Literacy Week, celebrating the work of our teachers and our educators who are also doing the work every single day, celebrating the ways you might be doing it in big and small moments in your communities. And then of course, just reminding everybody in the world that media literacy is more important than ever. I'm super thrilled today with our panel that we're gonna uh, have tonight with PBS teachers. We have a wonderful lineup of teachers who are going to discuss how they are approaching teaching critical media literacy at the high school level. All of our teachers are PBS certified media literacy educators, which means they have undertaken micro-credentialing to deepen their understanding of media literacy and especially worked on ways to incorporate that in their K through 12 classrooms. So they're all going to share insights about their teaching, their experiences, some ideas for lessons or resources, and also answer your questions. On that note, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat at any point. Um, we welcome them and we're really excited to have this conversation. So I'm gonna let every teacher introduce themselves um, with our wonderful panel, tell us your grade and the subject that you teach, maybe where you're located and we'll get started. And we'll start with Mary Kate. Hi, thank you, Megan. Um, my name is Mary Kate Lonergan. Um, I teach eighth grade social studies at a school district at a big suburban school district just outside of Syracuse. I've been teaching for 15 years and I have made media literacy the centerpiece or the heartbeat of my curriculum. Um, so I'm a passionate media literacy educator and I'm just so thrilled to be here and, and, and hear from everybody. Awesome, thank you. Kate. Hi everybody, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I am Kate Van Heeren. I teach in a small little rural school district in the center of Wisconsin. Uh, my normal job is I teach fourth and fifth grade social studies, uh, but as in small schools, I have many different roles. Uh, so I also teach middle school and high school literacy class or media literacy classes as well. Fantastic. Teacher of many hats. That's just shocking to me. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Aspen. Hi, everybody. My name is Aspen Mock. I am an English language arts teacher in Western Pennsylvania at a rural school, and I teach composition nine and 10th grade language arts and sometimes AP Lit 12. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Aspen. Kim. Good evening, my name is Kim Yates and I am a teacher at Pineville Independent School District, which is a very small school district in Eastern Kentucky. Um, for 13 years, I taught at the high school and collegiate level. And this is my first year teaching at the sixth and seventh grade level. So it's been um, quite the transition, but there's so much you can do with media literacy, even at the middle school level. So I'm really excited to be here and share um, some of the things I'm doing in my classroom. That's so wonderful. I think we don't often talk enough about those lower grades. So we're just so thrilled that you are here with us. And Lakina. Hey, my name is Lakina Ackerman, and I like to always give like a little uh, geography lesson. I teach eighth grade social studies. I'm from Richland School District 1. I teach at Southeast Middle School, and so we are in Richland County. My kids go to Lower Richland High School, and our school is located in the Southeast portion of Richland County. And so I tell them they never have an excuse not to at least know at least two of the cardinal directions. Um, I use a lot of media in my classroom because I, I like to mix it up a whole bunch. But this year, I also have my son in my class. And so I'm having to figure out the whole taking the phone away from him without you know doing all that stuff too. So I guess that's a part of media literacy as well. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here. Absolutely, right? I think every parent, teacher, guardian can relate to that. And sometimes I want to take the phone away from myself. So I think um, there's also that too. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I thought we would start with um, just, you know, digging into what we mean by critical media literacy. And Mary Kay, I wonder if you can share your perspective on that and what it means for you. Sure. So, you know, I'm namely 
defines media literacy as the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, um, act, and then reflect using all forms of media, uh, all, all forms of communication. So I think the critical aspect of media literacy is leaning into that analysis and evaluation. It's about asking evaluative questions and, and, and uh, analytical questions about the media that our students are consuming, but also this, the media that our students are creating. We're asking them to create, which that's a, a huge part of media literacy as well. So within, you know, within my classroom, that's asking questions about primary sources, but it's also asking questions about news. Who created this? Why? What's the purpose? What are the economics behind this? Um, what's the power in, in, in creating? Who holds the power in creating this message? But additionally, whose voice is missing, who's omitted, um, what might be missing, um, and, and what effects does this media have? So it's asking questions about um, the content of the media, but it's also asking questions about the, the creation, how it was constructed. Um, so I just, I think in social studies, ELA, it comes a little bit easier, but I think in science and math, you can still ask those questions as well. Absolutely. And I know, um, Kim, with teaching, you know, the sixth grade, seventh grade, like those middle school, how do you sort of explain to them what this idea of critical media literacy is and, and why it matters? What does that look like for that grade level? So typically I start my classes by discussing with students rhetoric. And it's a term that middle schoolers are not familiar with. They probably not heard much about what rhetoric is. So we go back and we look historically at what that concept looked like and how we structure arguments. And it's from there that we um, start analyzing media. Um, and, and before I, I ever let my students write, um, we analyze media first from a rhetorical context. So they look at things like the message of whatever piece of media we're looking at. Um, they talk about audience. So who was the audience for this particular piece? And they look at the speaker and what role that the speaker has in the creation of that type of or in that media. So um, it's really important, I think, for middle school students to be able to analyze media from this perspective, because it helps them to be cognizant um, and critical when they access media, because then they start questioning those things. And I think that's where we want our students to get to, whether that's academically or even socially, when we look at things like social media, um, when someone posts something, what's what's the message they're trying to get across to me, who's the speaker and who's the audience and start analyzing them from that critical perspective. Um, and then that often helps students translate into better writers because they get to see. So when I'm creating something, whether that's a written piece or some type of uh, media, um, they become cognizant of those issues as well. Who, how am I gonna speak to my audience? What are the things that um, are gonna be most effective in convincing them if I'm trying to, to you know, make a point? Um, and so we discuss that term critical a lot in my class um, because it generally has a really negative connotation. If, if someone's saying you're being critical of me, my students, you know, they kind of back away. But we talk about how um, critical is really important because it makes them uh, think deeply about a text or a, a piece of media, um, speeches or ideas or images that they're being inundated with daily. And so um, it takes them from that surface level. We talk about surface level learning versus deeper learning and being critical um, takes them from one level to the next. And so that's that's how I approach that with my middle school students. Yeah, that I, I like that you bring up that idea of like reshaping critical and what that looks like, because I also think it's important that we don't, you know, get too cynical, in, you know, through these exercises and, and reframing that idea of criticality, I think is so helpful with that. Um, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Key. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, because I was gonna say, like, the word critical, I also think gets a bad note these days in the news and politics. And so it's almost difficult to try to reshape it because it's getting because we have to also think about it too. Our students go home and their parents are also their educators, and whatever they see on TV, educators. So like it's important that we go ahead and start reteaching that concept of critical thinking, critical learning um, to them so that they could move forward with it. Yeah, that's so true, right? We we might have to be like 
deconstructing some of these understandings or perceptions in order to, to build on them as well. Um, Kate, with the grades that you teach, how does this work in that context? I think the idea um, too often, like we think of our younger learners that they're not using media or they're they're not ready to use this. And it's like I teach fourth and fifth grade and it seems younger and younger and younger. Our kids are getting phones or they're getting access on their own to online sources. Uh, so I know this is a high school group, but high school teachers who are here, whatever you can do to promote this in the elementary, I think is really important. Uh, because I think what's really unique in the elementary grades is we can start that criticality from the very beginning. Uh, you know, when I started teaching all the levels, I think it's really interesting because I see the classes that we started this within fourth and fifth grade. And it's just naturally for them to be like, okay, who wrote this? Who, you know, what, what was its purpose that just comes automatically to them when they're looking at sources versus starting this with the older kids. And that, I mean, they're completely capable of doing it, but it takes a little bit more. It doesn't come as naturally. So I think the earlier you can in introduce the idea of critical literacy, the, the easier it's going to be in a high school classroom. Absolutely. I remember the first time my fifth grade nephew heard a bounty commercial and he goes, oh, that's the good brand. Right. And I was like, wait, why do you think that? Um, so the, what you just said, Kate, just reminded me of that moment of like, if we're not, you know, having those conversations as they sort of arise naturally and we're just waiting until later, we're missing like so much growth in that. Um, Aspen, you do a lot of uh, media creation with your students to help them explore some of these topics and, and learn to understand what this looks like. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I primarily teach writing. And of course, in our writing courses, we also look at literature, we look at nonfiction, we look at media literacy. And I see a lot of um, bridging that can happen between fiction and nonfiction with media literacy because it informs the creation of the content that you're reading, um, even fiction. If we look at um, any fictional book, a lot of times there's more than just invention and imagination that go into it. It's the context, it's the social milieu, it's all of those critical factors and some facts and some imagine kind of go into that. So I think teaching students how to create their own media pieces in response to that, but also to um, just have their own imaginative pieces out there is really important. So we've done some work with um, KQED and their youth media challenges quite a bit. And with that, um, we had one particular challenge that we paired with poetry, if schools could dance. And so they chose poems from um, that are no longer, um, they're now in, in the um, Creative Commons, so they no longer have copyright attributed to them. And they were able to craft dances that help them understand the structure and the rhythm and all of the different literary devices in the poems and then translate those into a media piece that became a performance piece. What were the student reactions to like doing that project? I mean, how did they kind of reflect on what they thought about it? Like, was it, um, was there discomfort in like the, the creation part or did they love it? I'm just curious what that experience felt like for them. They really enjoyed it. And within the project, there's a lot of opportunities to contribute in different ways, just like we see with any creative outlet. Um, some of the students were able to do the voiceover part. Some of the students were ballerinas who had done ballet for many years. So they were comfortable with translating the rhythm into movement and dance. Um, other students were more into the filming of it. And so creating and, and editing the filming. So they were all able to access their talents and their strengths and what they were comfortable with to contribute to the creation of a media piece as well. That's awesome. And I know, uh, Lakina, you also do some media creation with your students. You want to talk about some of those projects? Yeah, so um, we actually got done with one. Um, we did, we created a colony it, so my kids created a colony and then they had to do a job for it. Like I grouped all of these projects into one, but the piece that I added on, which I think they actually liked is the kids had a job fair and for the 13 colonies. And so the kids had to write resumes 
for jobs that when they created their colony, a part of it was they had to come up with the jobs that they would do within that colony. And, you know, of course, I had to be like, okay, if you got South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, stay away from slavery, we got something that we're going to, you know, leave that piece out. But, you know, you still got planters, farmers, and things like that. So how could you my purpose in that was to get them to pers learn how to persuade people to get to your jobs and things like that and also give them a real world uh, job experience and so that was pretty cool they they actually had to give their resumes and go to the different job boards and actually have to interview it was super awesome like they interviewed and they stuck their resumes in the correct colonies and things like that um I'm next up I think I'm gonna do a little museum inside the lockers for the Revolutionary War. And so I'm hoping that will be good. I think, I try to always think of uh, literacy as not just reading. I try to pull in anything that I can. So I tell the kids, if it's not too cold, cause I had the cold weather, we're gonna go outside and play football, flag football to do the Revolutionary War battles. Um, we'll do the X's and O's and the battles that are here in South Carolina will play football you know, with the offense and defense and things like that so that they could, because we're not able to go to these different battle sites and things like that. And so it's like them being there. And then at the end, I always show the Patriot. Um, I know it's kind of gory, at least for eighth grade or whatever, but they like seeing it. And by the end, when I think it's really, you know, boring for them, they're begging me to find out what happened to Benjamin Martin at the end of it. They cry when Gabriel gets killed, but it's a perfect way for me to relate to them. Again, um, Benjamin Martin is like the three, Francis, Mary, and Thomas Sumter, and Andrew Pickens, and the kids can see those three guys in that one character, and it really connects with them when they can start picking out this stuff. Um, so, and I also think, too, the stuff I try to do, I want them to have a buy-in into it. And so the more they enjoy what they're doing, the more they're learning. And that's all, you know, I tell them we have to always do the boring part, the reading first. But the more we do it, the you know, the better fun that we'll have in the long run. And I think we we've been doing pretty good this year. So I love that you even brought up resumes because I think about just the idea of communicating for a purpose within the constraints of something that has like codes and conventions, right? Resumes, you know, have specific uh, constructs that we want students to understand and helping them figure out how to communicate within that construct is so media literacy, but we might not look at a resume and think that's media literacy, right? Um, that's awesome. I did, I did also tell them too, uh, you know, we just recently, September 11th happened. I tell them, uh, you know, we got the smart boards and things like that. And I was like, yo, when, when that happened, I can remember my sister being in high school and she said, how comes the TV cart? <laughs> They're like, what's that? I'm like, yeah, we had to get our news from the TV. But, you know, it it made a difference to them where, you know, they're thinking about, God, you're old. And I'm like slowly having to like reconcile with being old. <laughs> just like oh no. so yeah that. the tv car it's it's just an artifact um you know so on the opposite end of that things like podcasting and digital footprints i know that's something kim that you talk about with your students in that middle school year those years where you know maybe they're just getting their cell phones i don't know maybe they already have them um but you know why why is that important and something that that you do and what does that look like in your classroom so um, with po podcasting is such a great way to let students find their voice um, in a, a non-intimidating way because um, a lot of our students come from elementary and they are not confident writers. So when we are trying to get them to express themselves or to show us their learning in a different way, podcasting is one of the ways that we can do that. Um, coming from high school, one of the really neat podcasting projects that I did with seniors who were getting ready to graduate last year was we partnered with a group called the 957 Project, which is um, a veterans based um, group. And my students were able to develop interview questions and then interview veterans of post 9-11 wars. And then those became podcasts, which were donated to uh, the Library of Congress. So now they're stored there. Um, and so it's like an oral, it was an oral history project. And it was really wonderful for those students who were getting ready to leave high school um, because it gave them an opportunity to see things from a different perspective of someone that they would not normally interact with. 
So with my middle school students, um, that's that topic's a little bit heavy and a little bit mature for them. So what I'm doing with middle school students now is we are um, we just are in the midst of reading the book The Giver, and um, my students are are working on how one generation can learn something from the other generation. So um, we're kind of flipping the tables in that my students are doing a podcast called Teach the Teacher, where they pick a topic that they think that I don't know about. And they are creating a podcast where they come in with three questions. And by the end, I should be able to answer those three questions. And it's been great for those students because um, number one, it's giving them um, choice. Um, it's letting them explore topics that they're already interested in, but it's also putting them in the seat of being able to make sure that they're making um, choices about what people need to know. Um, so they really have to grapple with that information. There's so much information out there. Well, what's the most critical piece of information that I need to pass along? And so um, it's been a great project and we've had really great discussions. I know you mentioned digital footprint and I've talked with my students about once you put something on the internet, it's there um, and it's under your name. And so we're publishing these. And so we've had lots of conversations about that, which has spread to conversations about other forms of media that they may be putting on the internet. So um, it's just brought about a lot of good conversations. We don't often think about middle school students, um, but we know that now they are exposed earlier and earlier, like we talked about before. Um, so somebody needs to have that, those conversations with them. So it's been a, it's been a great opportunity for that. And I would add to just quickly, uh, just kind of going off that Veterans Day project, is you can do these types of projects with elementary kids as well. Um, we're in the midst right now. Uh, again, when you're thinking of these media projects is what are ways you can get your kids connected to the community? I live very close to a military base. Um, so I basically could say to all my students, find somebody within your social network that's either a veteran, and then I also open it up to active service members. And they're not necessarily doing podcasts, they're still doing the interview process, but they're making little biography videos. And this idea of being aware of choice, they have to pick music for it, uh, you know, and like we talk about why you wouldn't necessarily want to have the Benny Hill theme song in the background of an interview with a veteran. Or, and then they're doing these in front of green screens. So what type of pictures are you going to put behind you um, for example, just today we're, we're in the process of filming these, I had a kid try to do it in front of a donut and his, his argument was, well, my grandpa likes donuts, you know, this is a fourth grader. And I'm like, well, that's great. But if you're producing this for the community, are they going to get the donut reference? He's like, no. Um, and I think the more you get those kids to start making those choices, they see those choices in other forms of media. Like why, what is this music invoking in the background? What are these, why are these images there? And again, I think that helps with the idea of, you know, the criticality versus skepticism is it's not just, it's not skepticism, it's just understanding the choices that go into media production. And that covers small grades all the way up to, you know, the older kids. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, um, you know, teachers, feel free to jump in at any point. I did see the question in the chat too, and I don't know um, if anyone wants to, you know, kind of talk about that. I think it's such an interesting question. Rebecca had asked, um, you know, is it evident for students that doing rhetorical analysis on literature is transferable to social media posts or does it take some persuasion? And Mary Kate, I already see you're like, your head nodding. I don't know if you want to jump in on that one. Sure, I, I can. I just posted a little response. I, I found, I, can, I did a little in-district study on this. Are kids able to transfer those skills from social studies, you know, because historical thinking is essentially media literacy. So are they able to transfer for those skills outside of the classroom to other things like social media posts? And I found that they really struggle with that. And, uh, you know, um, so, so it takes, I, I know you're maybe kind of asking, like, do you need to convince them to do it? Yes. But I also think you need to explicitly and show them how to do it. Um, because they don't always equate the media that they're consuming with media because <laughs> it's so passive for, for a I, lot of them. Um, I agree with that because like, I think they're boxed in to, I can't do stuff like I use my little curse words or whatever in it. Like I normally do, I can't use my trap music. Like I normally do on my, on my Instagram, Snapchat, whatever posts. And so I don't know how else to convey it. 
And so it is difficult for them to get outside of that box. But then once you start letting them use things like the type of music that they listen to or things like that, I think, like you were saying, that is a buy-in for them to, to be able to do that. I even think um, I was just working with some students uh, yesterday about like this idea of persuasion and rhetoric and things like that. And I think in the context of like the classes where they practice it, literature, literary analysis, like, um, you know, civics and political ads and things like that. Um, but then when you, when I asked them, like, what do you write? Like when you're writing on social media and you want to convince somebody, like, what do you say? And they know, they like know it. And they do it, but they don't always label it. And I think that that's like such an interesting like disconnect that we have to kind of like help them bridge, right? I, I want to also say too, like, I think like, you know how your parents tell you that the type of stuff you listen to or read is stupid because when you know they listen to they listen to the cool stuff and then their parents probably told them i think that's probably one of the reasons why the buy-in is so difficult for us to try to get them hooked into it and so like um i always kind of think on those grounds as well like my mom probably thought like SWV and Invoke was stupid because she used to listen to Earth, Wind, and Fire. So what are they listening to? And I, I've also had to kind of pick up some tips. I'm, I'm afraid to say this. From my, from my son, I usually have to ask him, what is it that they're into <laughs> these days? So I can be on that level so that I can tell them, okay, well, that's appropriate to use and, you know, use it the way you want. But that, again, that gives them the buy-in. Absolutely. And um, I think you've all mentioned like, you know, re reaching out to like communities or like veterans and, and ask when you talked about like the um, challenges, you know, I think your flood project, which we put that link in the, in the chat. Um, and a lot of what I, f I feel like I'm hearing from, from teachers who are really experienced in this is connecting it to things like in their community or things that they care about, which is really kind of civics, right? Thinking about how we connect to these bigger spaces and, and and sort of network among our, our community. And so I wonder if, you know, um, Kim, Asman, if you can talk a little bit more about how civics is impacting the choices, the curriculum or the projects or how you help students, you know, um, connect to the world around them um, and what that is looking like in the work that you're doing. Sure. So um, one of the passions that I have as an educator, um, I am from the Appalachian Mountains and the Appalachian region. And we spend a lot of time in my classes discussing the portrayal of Appalachia in the media. So it's a really great place to start because I want my students to um, understand, you know, who are they as, as a group of people collectively um, and where do they come from? And so one of the projects we did last year was the Smithsonian has this great opportunity for um, schools to create documentaries about what makes their town special or their area special. Um, it's museum on Main Street. And so my students had the opportunity to create a documentary um, about our small little town um, who is kind of famous for a particular festival. It's like the longest running festival in the state of Kentucky. And it was really awesome to see them um, because within that documentary, they had to get out in the community and meet important people and learn the history of this festival that they've attended their whole lives but didn't really know anything about. And so um, there was so much growth in my students' knowledge about who they were and their appreciation of the people who came before them and those kind of things to make those connections um, based on this media creation project. And I know I have a link to that and then a link to a web, the website as well, that if that's a project that people are interested in, you can do an application for that. And it was really great um, because, again, that that helped that. Um, process of discovery of who they are helps to connect them to things that they can become interested in and ways to participate in their community. So all of those students this past year actually got to go meet the governor at the governor's luncheon and um, we got to interview the governor. So it went beyond just um, what we were doing in our town, but to a statewide level. And it was just a really great civic engagement experience for my students to um, be able to participate in that. And to further that, I think that civics is important in the sense that students need to be empowered 
to share their voices and they have to have a forum for that. So I think as educators, it's really imperative for us to design instruction with that in mind that when they're creating something that is media driven or media based, or even if they're writing something where they need to get their voice out there, that they have that authentic audience and you build that into the design of your instruction. So speaking to some of those projects and you had mentioned the Johnstown, um, the Johnstown Digital Storytelling Project from 1977 and the Johnstown Flood, um, we did something very similar where um, the students conducted qualitative interviews of survivors from the 1977 flood, and then they created digital stories that went on exhibit at the Johnstown Area Heritage Association. We've worked with JAHA, which is Johnstown Area Heritage Association, quite a bit on a lot of projects, so I think that um, is a really important component is to establish partnerships in the community where you can have those forums for your students to have voice. Um, at one point, I had written a grant with um, JAHA and National Geographic Education, and we were able to empower students from three different districts to write and illustrate with a professional illustrator as their guide a um, children's book called The Laurel Highlands Explorers. So it was a way for them to celebrate their region and celebrate the history of their area. And um, it was all seen through the eyes of the students and they created that. Um, another project that we created in that vein with um, JAHA was we were creating Johnstown Flood plays, a cycle of three plays that um, the students wrote that were original and they were fiction, but we had actually gone to the museum and they got, um, they had gloves and everything. They were able to go into the archives and they were working with artifacts that were, you know, hundred years old. And they were actually really able to dig into that research. We wrote the plays and that was the year that COVID happened. So we pivoted from that because we were no longer in school. We weren't able to create a performance. So we made them into podcast plays and had a really wide reach for that. So the students were able to see how there was something that was theatrically based, was able to become a media project ultimately. That it, podcast plays sounds amazing. I don't know if you can speak a little bit to, um, I, I'm sure there are probably teachers listening to this thinking about some of the tech skills required in having your students create um, all these media products and podcast plays. It sounds like something that would take a little bit of tech. Is that something that like Aspen, are you learning with them? I mean, are you um, like, how are you facilitating that as a teacher through the technology part of it? Well, particularly at that time, I thought there has to be a way all of their hard work has to be displayed because it was a whole year of them working on this as a, a side project as we went through the AP Literature and Composition course. And so I learned very quickly how to um, work with Audacity and um, the software with that and teach the students how to do that virtually. Um, also, I had a pool of actor friends who they were able to audition them, and then we created the podcast on Zoom. So we kind of took the idea of radio plays and we updated it and it became Zoom plays, really. Um, and so the students were able to sit in on that and give commentary as playwrights. So they actually felt very special because they were able to be involved in that whole process. And that was just really amazing for them. Um, and if you don't mind me speaking on that as well, one thing that I would really encourage um, teachers to do is reach out to uh, your local colleges because colleges sometimes will have whole departments um, dedicated to that kind of thing. And they are more than willing. We actually did that with our, um, our um, documentary project. We had a local college who had a whole media creation department. They came down, taught our kids, talked with us about stuff. They were great. And so um, there are some of those resources in the community that you can reach out to um, if you don't have that technical knowledge that they are more than willing to help out with those kind of things. So that's another place that you can look for help with the technical aspect. And just to plug too, when you're looking for organizations or like projects to take on, um, also your local historical societies, uh, they are usually incredibly in for any subject really, but if you're looking for a local project, uh, a lot of those organizations don't have education specialists per se, unless you're in a bigger area, um, but those are some of the most dedicated people to their communities and they're going to know fun resources and artifacts and things that you probably don't even know exist. Uh, so that's a neat partnership. 
Um, something I just want to add to with civics education, I think a lot of times teachers get scared when they hear civics education because automatically they think it has to be something with voting, which don't get me wrong, that's really important, but it doesn't have to be voting. And they don't have to be these large, elaborate projects, I think, that often get featured where, like, you know, kids get a recycling program started in their communities or, you know, they do some drastic change. And that's great. I mean, those projects are wonderful. And if you can take those on, I'm not like saying don't do those, but they don't have to be. You know, as these ladies mentioned, the projects they did, anytime you're really giving student voice and giving them a say, you know, in what happens is really, really important. Like I teach fourth and fifth graders. Uh, you know, we got, uh, so our, we got to pick books for our library, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but for our librarian to come into the school and be like, okay, you have to convince, you know, I have a $2,000 budget. You have to pick K through fifth grade books to put in our library. That was a huge project for them. And then they, you know, they had to sell it. And then they wanted to make commercials when we did this last year. Uh, and then it turned into a bigger project than I thought because then we put the commercials on our social media pages and then we had people vote, like community members could vote on these commercials. So sometimes you start these small projects and the kids get really invested in them and they are gonna take it to areas you never even thought of. Um, or you may start small one year and you adapt it again and this new idea may come to you. Uh, so it's okay to start small mm -hmm. when you're doing these things. If it's simply like you're doing a podcast and then you, you, you know, you put them on a Google classroom page or something. So different school members can, or members of the school can listen to them. That's the start. And I, I, can I add on to that too? Like uh, you build on community, uh, you, your school community, because like when the kids do have, you know, they start to learn how to use these different technology or whatnot they do take it and use it for like, for example, if you learn how to podcast or at least learn how to uh, do the announcements or things like that, then they want to go to the football, basketball, volleyball games and maybe call it, call it um, games for them. And then they always bring that back. It does, uh, the more they have, the more buy-in out, like, and I know I keep saying it, but the more buy-in that they have, they'll be more interested and it will build community in your local area. And it also builds school community as well. Absolutely. I love that. Um, start small and buy. And I mean, I think those, sometimes we forget, I mean, I'm guilty of it as a teacher, like, oh, like to do all the things. Um, you know, one thing that I think is important for us to talk about, and I'll open this up for anybody who wants to, to jump in, um, critical media literacy. And I think um, it's important to contextualize it in like all of the many ways that we think about media literacy. Um, but it also often asks us to think about like things like power, like who has power, who has voice um, in these systems and, and what the impact is on that. And um, even issues like oppression or, um, you know, justice and things like that. And definitely big tech has um, some influence, just a little influence in that. Um, and so I wonder how you're dealing with these conversations with your students at different levels and, and where that comes in and how you make that accessible and age appropriate for your students, if anybody wants to talk about that. I, I can quickly add a little something. I think I like to start with media literacy, giving them power. Um, that's how, that's usually how I frame it is media has power over us. Usually I start with how does media influence our beliefs and opinions? And as, as a social studies teacher, I can go back to that civics issue is I see media literacy as a fundamental civic skill. Like it is imperative to upholding our, our democracy, to, to help cultivate students who can make decisions based in rooted in fact and instead of emotion. And I mean, that's certainly plays a part in it, but but that's the idea. Informed, healthy skepticism is what we're trying to garner. Um, so anyway, but we start talking about how does media shape our, our beliefs and opinions and the power that, that I, yes, the media structures and, and social media companies have, um, but I sort of frame it as the power media holds in shaping who we are, our interests, our beliefs, our values. And then in social studies, we look at how media impacts the values and choices and decisions throughout throughout history. So that's one way I frame it. And I, I find that a very 
non-contentious way to go about it, considering the the current so you know the current landscape, political landscape we're in right now. I, I don't know if that's the answer, but I find that a very helpful way to sort of get into it. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Go ahead, Lakina. Perspective always is also something you have to look at as well. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about like maybe so, you know, I always show um, the Paul Revere's version, for example, of the Boston Massacre. And then we look at later forms of the same, that same event. Um, and that's always a good way to get the kids to see okay, why did he do this in the first place when he wasn't even there? And you know, you can always tie that back into the kids watching fight videos and stuff that they done filmed in the bathroom. And y'all starting the whole conversation the next day because y'all are jumping. It, it can always lead to something that's real world for them. Um, so yeah, perspective is always a big thing to keep in mind. And I think that's something that us as adults probably have to deal with too. And that's why we're having big stuff like that in the news that's going on. And um, I, I think the more we teach this stuff, the more we get these kids into what is going on with their media stuff, um, they're gonna change the world one day. And the media is also the ones that's telling them that they, won't, that they, they don't know what they're talking about. And these kids got a lot to say. And so I always tell them, you know, they're going to keep you down, but you need to learn how to use this stuff. If not for the very fact, save yourself, you're going to change the world and I get to watch you do it. So, yeah. Um, I think at the middle school level, we have to explicitly um, teach students about some of the um, things we've talked about because they don't often know how it works. They don't, they don't know how things work. So I think having explicit conversations with students about that, um, there's an activity I do where um, we don't have phones in our middle school, but um, what I'll do is on a particular day, they can bring their phones and we will research together a particular topic and we compare what results each student gets. And we talk about why there are differences. Um, what are the things that you have looked at before? Or what, what kind of things does the algorithm show that you're interested in? And how does that impact um, the types of things that are being pulled up now that we're researching a different topic? And so um, it's a really hands-on way for students to kind of see how that works. And um, because they just assume if they look something up, everybody gets the same results, which is not how it works. Um, and so I think that that's a really impactful activity for students that um, you can do to, to start um, introducing that concept at, at, at that level, because I think they do need to, to recognize and know um, that, you know, when we look at things like social media, we're the thing being sold, really, like we are the product because they want us to see ads and, and go to particular sites and those kind of things. And so I think that's just a really important conversation to have with students. I think too that metacognition plays a significant role in teaching in terms of thinking about your thinking. Um, an for an example, I can use, um, we read the novel Alias Grace in my 12th grade AP class. And in the afterword, Margaret Atwood, the author, talks a lot about how um, the media influences of that time, she really had to sift through that um, and with a very critical media literacy lens, try to figure out how she was going to write her historical fiction book. So one way that I have students work with that is sort of a meta media analysis where they pick an event that's occurring in the news and they research everything they possibly can about it. And then they write a summary of that event and then they take that event and then they translate it into what would be the opening of a novel. So we do about two or three pages of writing and they write a historical fiction piece in that genre. And so they get to think then about their rationale. Why did you present it the way that you presented it? What artifacts from the media led you to create this fictional piece? And so I think having them think about what they're thinking and why and then providing a rationale is also very essential. And again, I feel like I keep saying the same thing, but the, the younger you can start kids with these type of things and the smaller you start, the easier these things will be when you get into the older grades. 
uh, for example, things like perspective taking. I mean, I've seen kindergarten or kindergarten teachers do that effectively with kids. Uh, and again, getting the, the more you teach kids to use their voice at a younger age and do it, I hate the word appropriately, but I guess do it effectively, um, the better they're going to be at that with older grades. Uh, the thing that's really nice with younger kids is now this, this gets more nuanced as they get older, but if with younger kids, they have such a sense of justice and fairness. And again, it's very black and white at this stage, but the more we can foster that and like not forget that in the older grades, I think is really important. Um, but then with younger kids, when you're talking about having them talking to people with different perspectives, um, a lot of times younger kids, people won't say no to younger kids because uh, they're little and they're cute. I've had different people come in and speak and we've done Zoom sessions and they're always amazed about what you know these little kids ask. Um, I've actually had some politicians that won't come in anymore because um, of the questions that my uh, my fifth graders have asked them before. And um, I think, again, this changes as kids age, but they also have something I think called pester power. Because they're kids, um, the young, you know, the younger and the cuter they are, the more somebody's going to listen to them. Um, but, you know, you start with that when they're they're young, and then you you build on that as they get older, and you're teaching them more social skills, more critical literacy skills, and then by their time that you know they're seniors and they're ready to vote, you know, they can have a huge impact in the elections, and what happened like civic engagement in their communities. Isn't it? Do, do you guys find it like really scary though that I, my ten year old basically grew up with a device in his hand and he knows how to zoom through it quicker than I can? Um, it, that's almost terrifying to me because I I don't want to get to a day where I don't understand how to use the technology or I don't get it and I I want to see. And I don't know, it, it's just kind of, I don't know if anybody else has dealt with that, but just like thinking, I still think 1990s was like three days ago. So yeah. <laughs> you're not alone in that, like, you know, just yeah. know, like you are not alone in that. Um, I think we all feel that a little bit. Um, and I actually think, you know, this, that sort of speaks to like Rebecca's question here um, in the chat which feels like it hits on like um, the super secret agenda of media literacy, which is that, yes, we can teach a lot of stuff through all of these projects. Um, but I think this question is, these two questions are so worth our time. Um, how do we prioritize which skills we're truly developing or assessing with some of these projects? And how do we communicate those priorities to students? Um, I think those are, I mean, cause yeah, media literacy is so broad, like we're doing so much, right? Tech and voice and creation and rhetoric and all of that. So I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on that. How do you prioritize what your, what skills you're working on and your assessment and how do you communicate that? To I students? take my cue from my students. Some years they're interested in doing one thing and other years the kids think it's boring. Next couple of years, that same thing that was boring to those kids come, you know, to be brand new again. They will tell you how they want to learn. Um, and we have to always remember that what we produce to them, we're producing it from just our perspective. We have to remember that our kids learn differently. And so we have to always remember to teach it differently as well. And it, like the beauty of it is there's, we always like to think that literacy just means reading a book um, or that's where, you know, the mind always goes. We have to remember there's so much stuff that we can use um, that will help us. And the kids are always interested in doing, let them, let them pull you where they want you to go sometimes. And I promise you, you'll get like the best lessons. You'll feel the most satisfaction from them because they, they're learning their own way. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, I don't know, um, Kate, I saw you unmuted. I don't know if you wanted to jump in on that. Um, I was just gonna add too, it's really important to know the pulse of your community. Uh, for example, if you're teaching in an area that's one political ideology and you're nervous about, you know, introducing some of these projects, maybe you need to focus more on teaching other perspectives first. Uh, you know, if 
depending, look, I mean, looking at what your local issues are in your community, maybe you're using those to teach some of these skills, but I, you know, knowing your state standards, knowing do you have an administration that's going to follow you and what you want to teach, uh, I think is really, really important. That's such a good point, Kate. And, and maybe we can even re reframe this and ask like, you know, media literacy standards um, and skills outcomes can fit in so many places in our curriculum. So um, when we think about like what we're assessing or what skills we're trying to aim for, are you all looking at the standards you already have to teach and saying, oh yeah, like the, I see media literacy in there and that's how I prioritize it? Or how are you making some of those connections? So one of the best professional developments I've ever received regarding media literacy is from Project Look Sharp, which is a nonprofit based out of Ithaca College. They do, if you aren't familiar, go to their website. They have free lessons and units uh, for teaching media literacy skills. They're phenomenal. I will, I will also tell you I'm biased. I do some work for them, but they got me into media literacy. Anyway, sorry. Um, their approach is it doesn't have to be another thing. Pick your content, find the piece of media that you want to, an engaging piece of media that you want to decode or critically analyze, whatever you want to call it with your kids, make sure it fits your content standards, and then pick from the key concepts of media literacy, almost like a media literacy standard. And what do you, what media literacy skill do you want to address while you're engaging with the piece of content, media content that goes with your content standards? So I'll give you an example. I do, we take a look at the beginning of the unit for Great Depression. We look at the migrant mother, right? Famous image. We decode it. Talk about what do you see? What stands out to you? What emotions do you feel? What, you know, but then we also get into the question of our photographs, are they fact? Are they opinion? Are they something else? So we dive in, we use that question as a way to dive into the content, the choices that the creator made when, when Dorothea Lang took that picture. And then what questions do you have that would help you determine is this fact, opinion, or something else? But anyway, to get to the, the standards, it's I pick my content standards, I pick my media, and then I pick what media literacy standards or key concepts I want to, and I'm not, you're never doing all of them. You're doing one or two. Don't, you can't do all of them at once. I mean, you can, it's really, it's really tough. I think that's so helpful. And Project Look Sharp, yeah, we put that link in the chat. They, awesome. I mean, just so good. And Lakina, thank you for sharing that one too. I know that we're almost out of time and we've gathered you here as PBS certified educators. And I'm sure there are folks who are interested in just hearing a little bit more about that, um, the process and, and your experience with it. And so maybe Aspen, we can start with you if you don't mind sharing a little bit about that, um, what that looks like, maybe even how long it took, just a little bit about your experience. Sure. I think I was one of the very early um, educators who got certified through PBS. And this was probably about four or five years ago now, I think I received my certification. And when I looked at the website, I looked at all of the different modules that needed to be fulfilled. And um, from that, you don't really have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. You can pick projects and lessons that you already have in your class and you can apply it to the certification process. And so I remember going through the process. It was pretty pretty brief, about six months, I think I went through the process. And um, it was really, I think, paired with KQED Teach, which is their platform that can help support through the certification. You really learn so much. And we had talked about um, some of the ed tech that's needed earlier. So through that, I was introduced to we video and Soundtrap, you become proficient in those and advanced in those, and then you get to use them in your classroom. And so going through that process was really um, a great learning experience and it also helped to celebrate the things that and reaffirm the things that I was already doing in my teaching. So it's really a great process and um, you work with some really wonderful people. Um, now I'm actually one of the micro credential assessors for Digital Promise for the PBS certification. So I really enjoy being on the other end of things um, and getting to look at the submissions and all of the amazing projects that come through and, and how teachers are approaching media literacy across all grade levels. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Aspen. Does anybody else want to share any any nuggets from going through the credentialing? 
I like I think what Aspen said about um, how how uh, it causes you to like once you finish a credential, it makes you feel like, oh wow, I could do it. <laughs> like, and it, it it was like for me, I I went through them. Like I tried to like it was almost like I was hooked on it, trying to get these. And once I got one, I was like, oh man, I'm on top of the world or whatever. And but again, you like she said, you're using stuff that you're already doing in your classroom, and that is especially in the last few years or so, that is so beneficial for us as the educators to uh, get that confirmation that we are good. We are really good and uh, we know what we're doing. We just have to go out there and do what you do every day in your classroom. And I just wanted to add too, for those who are interested, you really can do it how you want. Um, like, you know, Aspen mentioned she did it in six months. I did a, did it in a year and a half off and on, um, you know, and like KQED has the classes that you can take. And then basically they walk you through getting the micro credential for whatever the class is for. You don't have to have the classes. Uh, for example, I know one of the credentials is like, what is your, um, your digital like use policy in your classroom? And I had already had designed that. So I could just submit that off and I got that one. Um, but it's also really cool because it, makes you think of things that you didn't necessarily think of because when we think of digital you know we think of media literacy how many of us actually have a policy for what we how kids get on the internet in the classroom and I'm like oh that is really kind of important you know and like digital citizenship it's something we kind of assume sometimes but we forget about that we actually maybe have to teach that to kids uh so really it kind of covers all aspects of media literacy Fantastic. Well, we are basically at time. And so uh, I don't see any lingering questions in the chat, but I wanted to take a second and just say thank you to all of the teachers for being here and sharing your experiences and your resources and your ideas. Um, what a wealth of knowledge. This is not the first time um, we hope to hear from you. Um, we are looking for ways to help all of these awesome PBS certified teachers bring their expertise to our Namely community more frequently. So hopefully we'll have you back again and not overstay our welcome with those invitations. But thanks for being here. And for those of you uh, watching and joining us, thanks for joining us tonight as well. Happy Media Literacy Week. <laughs>